Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest Level Up Roundtable, Monetizing a Roblox Experience. I'm Erin, also known as Breakfast Candy, and today we'll be joined by three amazing developers and Roblox's own Dan, aka DSPAV. Dan, take it away. Thank you, Erin, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We're really excited to have this roundtable. Uh, I think this is probably our most highly requested roundtable uh, whenever we send out a survey to everyone. So we're excited to finally get to it today. We're joined by some awesome panelists with some really great experiences. Uh, and we're going to jam on some really great monetization topics today. So starting it off and introducing first from the emergency response Liberty County team, I want to introduce Sean and Tripp. Guys, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. How are you guys doing today? Hey, uh, thanks for having us. Doing great. Yep, doing awesome. Awesome. So introducing each of you, I like to start out with our street cred to start. Tripp, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do on the team and uh, how long have you been on Roblox? Uh, well, I've been on Roblox since I was a little kid, about 2010. Um, started playing, you know, police and city games and then I made a game of my own. Uh, emergency Response, Liberty County. It's been out since 2018. Okay, and uh, what do you do on the team? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I basically just kind of lead everything, general direction, just kind of the vision of the uh, future updates and just put everything in order and uh, a little bit of UI and UX here and there. Awesome. Awesome. And Sean, tossing it over to you, please introduce yourself. Flex your yeah. Roblox street cred. How long have you been on the platform? I've been on since uh, about 2011. And for the game, um, I pretty much do any of the main scripting. So like if you see an update come out, any of the coding behind it is pretty much me for the most part. And uh, yeah, I've been on with the game since December 2018 and it's been cool. I, I see. So you do like all the real work and Trip's just like the idea guy, right? Yeah, you can say <laughs> that. How'd you guys meet? How'd you guys uh, get together and start working on emergency response? Uh, we met in a role play group on Roblox and we met through a mutual friend actually because we all were in that group at one point working for it and then a mutual friend which is our community manager Lost Infinity he he basically hit me up like hey you know why don't you just come work for the game and I was like oh you know try to try to set something up with me and Trip, and luckily it all worked out nicely. It was it was basically immediately after um, I released the early access alpha version um, and, and they just hit me up, said, hey, do you need some help? And yeah, I did. Yeah. So emergency response is kind of popular. When, what was like, was there a moment when it suddenly blew up or like, can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, well, from early access release in late 2018, um, it pretty quickly started to get some traction and it wasn't a lot at first. It was paid access uh, when we first released an early access. And it was almost 300 Robux, uh, but within weeks we had full servers and, and it just constantly and organically grew from that. Yeah. Well, I love that you mentioned paid access because I think that's a really uh, interesting experience that you had that not every developer has. So I'd, I'd love to pick your brain on it today, but ultimately I guess we could start high level and we'll dig in later on today, but like, what was the, what was the decision to switch from paid access to free to play? Uh, well, we just, we initially, we had decided to make it paid access just during early access during alpha and beta to kind of limit our release to market um, until the game had all the planned features that we uh, wanted it to have, and also to just support development. Um, but we, we slowly lowered the price all the way down to 50 and then 25 Robux right before going free to play. And we did it just to, to reach the greater market and the game was... Um, uh, by the time we went free to play, it, it had everything that we wanted it to have for a full market push. So you felt like you had enough content ready for the greater hordes of Roblox to come. That's in. right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, Aaron, I believe we have a clip uh, of emergency response here uh, for those living under a rock who have never seen or played it. Uh, maybe we could show them what it's all about. You wanted a map expansion? You got it. Explore areas like the new historic downtown strip and the new industrial zone. With new AI generated emergencies, hey! you can rescue civilians from plane crashes, tunnel collapses, car wrecks, and more. 
who will you be in Liberty County? Explore the new summer update today. Awesome. So summer is over, I guess. So it's not the new experience anymore. But how did that do for you guys? Uh, it was pretty good. Um, the entire community loved it. Uh, since we usually have a an annual tradition of every summer update, we kind of make the map bigger. So this time we pretty much doubled the map, introduced a whole bunch of features they loved. And yeah, there's definitely a lot of hype surrounding it. Awesome. All right. Well, moving on, waiting patiently to introduce herself. Actually, once again, because she is our very second uh, returning guest to the show, Arithia. Welcome to Level Up again. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, so I'm Arithia and I have a new title. I'm now the Director of Creativity at Twin Atlas. Uh, before I was working with Sonar Studios, but recently we merged as companies. Um, and I co-founded Sonar Studios with Alert Coder F. And I've created Creatures of Sonaria, Dragon Adventures, and now I'm working on Griffin's Destiny. And I, I do 3D modeling, animation, general game design, and environment design. So well, everything first of visual. All, congratulations. That's incredible. Uh, all of your success there. Secondly, I have a question for you. So now you're the you're sort of the head of everything. Do you actually get to do any of that art and animation and stuff anymore? Or are you still? Oh, like, yeah. Signing yeah. And stuff? yeah. I mean, director <laughs> of creativity kind of comes along with working on core games. So I really got lucky with that, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would never give up working directly in games. Never. That's my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. So you you would never want to like manage the people who do it. You always kind of got to get in there and do it. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, maybe your most recent project you're working on, actually, Griffin? Yeah. So Griffin's Destiny is actually releasing fully in three days. Um, it's free to play and you role play as a Griffin. And we're kind of taking a more modern approach on like animal role play games. So it's pretty interesting, which I'll be able to speak on later today. Um, with like the crates and all that kind of stuff. So tons of cool information on that. Awesome. Awesome. So there you have it. I know we're going to be uploading this video a couple of weeks later, but for those who are attending today, you know, they get the sneak peek of this awesome game that's coming out. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you mentioned you have like a couple of titles under your belt now. Are you nervous anymore on new releases or is this kind of like just another day at the job for you? Um, no, it's it's just another day, another day, another dollar. Uh, you know what yeah. they say. <laughs> but you know, we we've already seen the numbers and people are already so excited. And I feel like with our kind of tendency to release games as soon as they're playable, it's just we kind of see how it's going to do early on. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys, yeah, you're you're pretty well known for doing sort of like an early access thing and then mm -hmm. suddenly pulling the switch. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. I believe, Aaron, right, we have a trailer of formerly known as Sonar Studios, now Twin Atlas, and some of the great creations that you have here. In a world where creatures roam, dragons fly, battleships sail, and beasts lurk, fight, survive, build, and conquer. with Sonar Studios. Awesome. Was that you doing the uh, voice acting for that video? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. all me. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for joining us. All right, those are our introductions. These are our panelists. Let's go ahead and hop into the highly anticipated monetization conversation. Starting off, I wanted to ask you all about monetization goals and throw out a little softball to everybody here. Um, why might developers want to monetize their games? Uh, I guess I'll start off. Um, I guess it's it's pretty straightforward for us. Uh, it helps to get paid for your work and can can provide a sustainable job for you. So developers can you know be full time and everything or part time, however they want. And also allows you to hire more developers and buy more assets and other resources to further the development of your game. Yeah, sure. that's a good yes. point. Something yes. else. If, if if you 
uh, can make games and you like to make games on Roblox, then why not have it be your full time job, and pay the bills? Yeah. Yeah, I totally see that. So <clears throat> obviously, I don't want to do a real job like working at a bank or something. So I get paid to make video games. And also, I Sean, I like your point, too. I, I hadn't really thought of it that way. But, you know, a steady income allows you to hire more people to create even bigger, cooler content, right? Yeah, definitely. Because at the start, it was only it was pretty much only um just the three of us working on the game. But by now, our team has expanded to, I think, roughly 10 or 15 people. And I'm sure Sonar Studios definitely has a whole lot of employees, too. So it definitely helps out. Yeah. Or sorry, uh, Twin Studios. Yeah. I, I forgot it, but yeah. <laughs> the creative, the director of creativity at Twin Atlas, can you attest to that? Where? What were your humble beginnings in terms of like development and where are you guys at now? <laughs> I mean, I feel like a lot of developers resonate with like working for free off the off the bat. Like a lot of us didn't pay ourselves. We're scrounging to feel like we can even pay rent at times. But now that, you know, teams expand and there's more games that we want to do, more ideas, we definitely monetize for ourselves for making money and you know definitely players can oftentimes see that as kind of selfish or not understand that but I would also say that we want to monetize because it took so long for so many of us to hone and practice our skills that you're paying for developers who have worked so hard and really understand the art of game development yeah that's a great point it's kind of like you know doing elaborate paintings and then just handing them out to, for free. Like, you know, you're not really doing yourself a service there, but I've also seen that from a lot of developers I've interacted with where they feel like, you know, they kind of have imposter syndrome and they're like, I don't know if my work is like good enough to make money. So I don't really charge for it. Right. But if you think about the time and the effort and the passion that you put into your work, right. Like ultimately you, you deserve it. Right. Like, you know, this is your skill and this is your career that you're sort of pursuing. So why not, you know, try and make a career of it. Yeah, I think those are all valid points. Um, so let's look at the flip side of that. Like, why would players want to spend money in the game? Maybe I'll toss it over to the emergency response team first. Yeah. Um, so to have better items in games, and, uh, to unlock new perks, to look cooler, and to feel like a better player, um, all great reasons to spend money in a game. And if you if you build something great, players will be more than happy to spend money on it um, to to uh, show off to their friends and, and maybe even advance their friends in certain situations. Um, uh, we have Mafia in our game, like Mafia's uh, for criminals to form. And if you buy the criminal game pass, you can it gives you a lot of different features for the Mafia, for example, and you can up the percentages of different members in your mafia to pay out from robberies and stuff like that yeah um i believe aaron we have an example from emergency response here in terms of like buying expensive items yeah there we go so this uh mobile command center and this really expensive car here um players could play the game for a really really long time and grind at it or you could skip the grind pay a little bit and unlock it early and look cooler than all your friends yeah awesome and i mean bringing it back to the original question which is like why would players want to spend money in your game this is a question you guys are often thinking about and trying to answer with like content you're creating right yeah yeah so um there's many different aspects to it. why would they want to spend money um, in a social system why would they want to spend money in a progression system in a currency system um, so there's many different answers to it, but it all goes back to just um, advancing yourself as a player and being get, making yourself a little bit better player, uh, but you without giving yourself an unfair advantage. Yeah, and this is a question I commonly get from developers, so I'll toss it over to you and put you on the spot here. But like, at what when you're designing a feature, you're you're mentioning like progression systems and all these things. When you're designing a feature, at what point do you start considering monetization? Do you do it all the way from the start? Do you build out a really fun system first and then put it on top of it? Like, what's your general strategy? Not from the start, not at all. Uh, you want to make it a fun feature from the start. Uh, design it to be fun and valuable to the players from the start. And then later on, you can think 
And is this something that we could monetize? Is there some mechanism here uh, that we could integrate monetization? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, if the answer is no, we don't want to try and force it. Uh, we're not going to take a great fun future and make it not fun just to make money off of it. Um, so monetization kind of comes second and you fit it in where you can and it works out. Yeah, that's a good point because you do want players to spend because they're enjoying your game, not because they feel like they have to. Right, right. Those are the kind of systems that create like a pay to win scenario and also sort of like scare away a lot of players who could potentially be enjoying your game like everybody else. Yeah. If you If you build it, if you build something fun, they will come and they will be happy to pay for a good value. There you have it, Field of Dreams, but video games. Uh, Arithia, I wanted to toss it over to you. Same question for you. Why would players want to spend in your large portfolio of games that you have right now? So I would say for us, it's actually pretty similar. You know, players just want to boost themselves, boost their progress in the game, or have really cool cosmetics that kind of differentiate themselves from other users. Our games, you know, they're super customizable with colors, materials, designing your, your own creature to kind of look how you want it. Um, but, you know, similar to the emergency response, like the first and foremost, goal that we have is making sure that our game is really good on a base level and making sure that players can't get from the start of the game to immediately the end of the game so there's always a lot of balance there to make sure players still have to actually play the game and enjoy it yeah well i've seen like a, a few of the games that you guys have shipped and i've noticed for a couple of them you guys don't even have monetization in there at the beginning right like you're so yeah focus what are the things like you're focused on at that point when you're launching the game um so right dragon adventures didn't even have monetization i don't think sonar creatures of sonaria did either right off the bat we're just trying to make sure that the game is playable and enjoyable before we start adding like all right how can we how can we start making money off of this and you know sometimes the systems just come naturally like this this is how players unlock new creatures. Obviously, this is something we can monetize. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not at the forefront of our thought when we're designing a game. It's just kind of there. Like we're we're aware of it and we're ready once the game is more developed to kind of monetize off of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Aaron, I believe we have something to share from creatures as well on this. Yeah, so th this is just one of our shop menus, and this is how creatures obtain, you know, more sought after creatures, and these are developer creatures, and they're usually designed after our game developers, so it's kind of a way to highlight our game developers and tie in a really cool creature with, with them. Do they get all the proceeds of the sales? So, no. like, incentive to create the coolest avatar? No, <laughs> <laughs> no not really. Awesome. All right. Well, we talked about it a little bit, but I wanted to talk about monetization goals. Um, what should, Erythia, this is for you first, but what should developers consider when setting up monetization goals? So uh, since Griffin is coming out, this is kind of like on my mind right now where maybe it's not as much on other games, but um, after your game is completed, I try to think of how much money would I like to make and how much money I realistically think I'm going to be making and kind of setting healthy goals um, that's reasonable for the player base. And for me, it's important to consider the starting and end point of my game because I don't want the player to spend their way through the game. Otherwise, they'll, they'll be finished with the game and they won't really have any reason to play it. Um, on top of that, it's really important me to consider the range of monetization you know, how much Robux are players buying with USD, trying to look at those tiers and kind of set up fair values in the game. Um, and you want a healthy range of that because not all players have, you know, thousands of Robux and some players have a little Robux. And even that to them is really valuable to think that they're supporting the game, you know, 15, 30 Robux, and they, they feel like they're supporting or even getting something small and cool. Hmm. So when you are actually setting your monetization goals, you're looking to serve every group of, of player that there is from those who want to spend a thousand Robux to those that want to spend in the case you just mentioned, like 30 Robux, right? Yeah, exactly. And then offering, you know, if they just want cosmetic items 
or if they're trying to boost their way. So offering a variety of items for them to purchase. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, the the other thing that you mentioned there that I thought was interesting was you mentioned you never want to set up monetization such that a player can just spend through the game, right? Yeah. So like, what's what's the alternative there? Like if they're not buying, you know, 10 levels in your game or they're not buying the best gear in the game, like what are the alternatives there um, that are more healthy for the overall sort of progression of your game? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I would say we don't really offer right now, we don't offer boosts where the player can just, you know, level up super fast, at least in Griffin's Destiny. We just offer, you can get in-game currency and that's fair because that's just like a repetitive purchase and not really buying the end content immediately. I mean, that's something that I would personally experiment with, but I don't know. I feel like if emergency can like jump in on that, I'm not really sure. <laughs> Phoning a friend, emergency response. What are your thoughts? Uh, could you repeat it just to make sure I don't mess up? Yeah. So, so rather than just selling straight up power in the game, right. Or just selling, you know, going from level one to max level as like a game pass or something like what are alternatives that, that you as developers sort of consider uh, for players in those situations? Oh, so um, in, in our game, we obviously have a progression system, like different rankings, but it's basically like level one through, let's say nine, for example. And uh, for those people wanting to try to pay to win, we offer a different alternative to where they can't directly purchase, you know, experience points to progress themselves, but they can unlock they can unlock the items early. So say if we locked a vehicle behind a certain rank, instead of waiting to actually achieve that rank, you could pay Robux and get that vehicle early. So that's kind of the alternative we have just because a rank, um, your level, it does have some significance. It kind of shows, yeah, you put in the work you got here. And at least that will always stay true to each player, including the free players. And especially if you haven't paid anything, it shows you got this far without paying. But it still gives the people who want to try to pay to get ahead just something, you know, like a little perk for them. Trip? Yeah, but um, noting with that, we the the things they can unlock doesn't necessarily make the game easier for them. It's just, you know, cooler cars, better cars, you know, some more features on your car. But it doesn't make it, you know, any easier to arrest criminals or, or play the game for that matter, really. Yeah. I think given all of that, it seems like the common thread here is that you're allowing players to pay for passion in terms of like cosmetics and looks and, you know, different looking things, but you're expecting your players to still put in the time to get good at the game, to experience the game and whatever else, right? So that might also come in like XP boosts or something like that, where it's like, you know, you could get double the XP, but you still have to play this game during this time. We're not just going to give you the 10 levels. You can just grind at 2x the speed to get there or something, right? Right. The fun comes from actually playing the game and getting good at it yourself and, and being, you know, the best cop on the team, being able to arrest all the criminals. Um, and you, that's something you can't pay for. You have to play for. Yeah, it's almost like you're getting them to pay you to not play your game, which is not really, not really yeah. what you want, right? And it's kind of also structured. So like, say a person who kind of just started, if you maybe put in like an hour or two to get decent, you can still compete on the same level as someone who's the max rank, just because they may have a few more tools to maybe help them arrest someone, you can still, you know, just as easily go around and do what you have to do. And you could still progress at a decent rate without feeling overpowered. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Awesome. Well, bringing it back to the question, I wanna toss it over to you guys as well and pick your brain on this. Uh, what should developers consider when setting monetization goals? Uh, I, I'll go. Um, they should, developers should consider, uh, I guess like we mentioned, how the free player plays and how you know the paid player plays that Ideally, the free player should still be able to access all or if not most, you know, maybe in certain cases like the game pass, but in the majority of cases, you should still be able to access like all the content for free pretty much, whether that's through grinding and raking up or whatever you want to do with that. But 
as long as they're having fun and still getting through the game and that nothing is behind a paywall that's actually important so you could maybe put a vehicle behind a paywall since that may not be so important in our game but say if you have a driving based game that you need to get a certain lap time for example and you can only get that lap time with a really fast car they had to pay robux for now you're sort of hindering their progress behind a paywall which isn't the idea when you're introducing monetization trip yeah and um when we talking about monetization goals and how we what we consider uh monetary wise we don't actually uh, plan any goals as like hitting a certain number or um a certain number of sales or revenue whatever our goal is to make it fun and make it flow and just to make it work well as a game okay great well, I wanted to move on to our next topic, which is probably heavy on everybody's minds, and that's just the ethics around monetization and balance. Um, and, you know, starting off, the first question I wanted to ask is just what are some of the uh, ethical concerns of monetization? Um, well, uh, kind of making money from kids here. Um, you know, you don't see kids going into Walmart and buying things on their own, but you do see kids going into games and buying things without their parents' permission sometimes. So you don't want to make it misleading and you don't want to make it, um, you know, like a trap. You don't want to trick them um, and you don't want to uh, um, like sell them on something that, that you don't need to sell them on. Um, so you just tread carefully be honest and try not to make it something that um, they get lured into. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything to add? I, I would okay. add that there's also a bit of just being honest with all players, regardless of age, even older players, like they want to see kind of what they're receiving. So showing numbers as much as you can and being upfront with players about what they might receive is really important. Yeah, that's a good point. Like everything in life, communication is, is the most important thing. Um, and that's that's often I've seen in the past where a lot of developers get in trouble is they advertise something as something players can obtain easily, and it's not. And uh, that's where a lot of the ethical concerns come in. Um, yeah, oh, and uh, sorry, just to add on to that, um, a lot of times, you know, not everything is gold. Sometimes things do go wrong, like maybe a transaction is mishandled for whatever reason um adding on to the honesty is having a good support system so say if a player feels cheated out of their money they want to come express their concerns to see whether that's showing your gilded or any other server you should allow them to be able to join get the proper help so if something did indeed go wrong they you know fully get what they were owed rather than feeling scammed at the end of the day yeah it's a very good point um I know that this is kind of common sense, but I'm going to ask it. Uh, why should developers be concerned with being ethical with their monetization? Maybe Arithia for you. Um, I would say if your game completely relies off of loot boxes to make any money at all, that would be very concerning. Um, but as long as you offer plenty of options to the player and fair options, um, I don't think you have anything to worry about, but definitely don't fully rely on, you know, RNG chance-based stuff that can be really frustrating to players to kind of spin, 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 and never get the item that they're looking for. So as long as you have systems for them to obtain those items or other ways to get really cool items, that would be good. Yeah, that's a good point. And and in that same line, is there a way to make those systems more fair? Especially like RNG, especially, obviously you could, if it's a one in 20 chance, you could get it on the 20th chance or you can get it on the 1000th chance, right? Yeah. So how do you sort of mitigate that risk and that poor experience for players? I definitely think, I've been experimenting with this with Griffin, Griffin Sassany, but I would say one game that does something is a pity Pull, and that's if you've been spinning so many times eventually you just get a very rare item I would really say that's a great way to go about it or what I've been doing for Griffins is 
if you have rare or legendary items in the game, maybe offer those as their own kind of separate chests where the user is always guaranteed an epic or legendary based item. And they, you know, they pay a little bit more for that item, but they're guaranteed it. Um, and also, you know, we just have a regular shop where users can buy stuff without rolling. Yeah, that's a very good point. You definitely want to mitigate greed on that front. And then another way I sort of pitch it too with the streak breakers, I love that you brought that up, is you didn't design the system in the example I gave to have them spin a thousand times to get that item. You designed it so that they would get it after 20 times on average, right? Yeah. So the only thing you're doing at that point is creating a poor experience for your players and damaging your own reputation, which is very important, right? Yeah, definitely. You don't want to be the developer who's known as, you know, the greedy person who's trying to pinch me for every penny that I have. You want to be a person who gives out the awesome unicorn pets at this rate that everybody wants and can trade with one another. So um, I guess in that same line, like how does balance affect player perception on a monetization system? Um, you know, Trip, Sean, maybe for you guys, like, pricing of your cars or you know the other offerings that you have like how much does balance go into it and why is it important for making sure that you keep a monetization system ethical yeah um you want to make it balanced not too aggressive because an aggressive monetization system will make players feel like the game is pay to win um and if if they don't feel like they're getting a good value if they feel like they're getting scammed or or taken advantage of, well, they're just gonna steer away from your game, you know, the players, the community, and you're just gonna see numbers go down across the board. And of course, sales go down as well. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, pricing items, it you should have a decent reference point, like maybe compare yourself to other games and their pricing points for their in-game currency and make sure to sort of line it up because it's good to it's good to price it accordingly to where if a free person were to do it and you know spend eight hours grinding is it fair to only price that at say 20 robux to a paid person like are are you truly valuing eight hours of time into 20 robux now that might make the free player feel like wow you know that's that's kind of you know poor that they only value my time at 20 robux so maybe consider pricing it higher just to show like hey we really want you to do this for free if you really want to try and get ahead maybe here you can go ahead and pay this instead but of course it's always like oh it's just finding the right middle number right balance for everything because you of course you don't want to go too aggressive too high with the price yeah and in that same line because i i also get this question all the time where do you even begin as a developer to price an item like where what's your sort of starting point for that i can take this one because I always wondered this myself too. And when I first, when we first introduced our first game passes, this was after, this was after several months into the game after Alpha. And, but we, uh, first of all, I'd ask myself, what if I were a player of this game, what would I, what would I pay for this? What do I think is a fair value as a player? Um, and hopefully, you are a player of your own game. And then. You want to look at other games, maybe find another game that's similar to yours in the same genre or whatever, another city role play game that offers a similar, say, game pass or feature, a similar amount of content. What do they charge for it? Uh, and are they successful with that? Are they charging too little, too much? Um, and then lastly, uh, monitor sales and, and make changes from that. Uh, is it selling too slowly, maybe too quickly? Do you have more people getting this than you expected? Um, you can always make changes better late than never. Yeah. Ari, anything to add to that? Um, I would say our games are definitely similar, but what is different is we actually come up with you know, our currency, we have usually mathematical equations that we come up with to kind of predict where things are at. So uh, you know, if a player is playing the game for five minutes, for 30 minutes, for an hour, how much are they actually making in those time sessions? So after we kind of get those numbers, then we can predict a Robux to in-game currency ratio. And I feel like a lot of the times our ratios are like one in-game currency to, you know, like 0 
of a Robux. And we kind of go off of that for pricing the in-game currency. And then I can be like, okay, so 100 hours of a player's gameplay is about average to this. And then I can kind of price items off of that. And it's a, I really like that system for items, but I would say for game passes, I definitely like snoop on front page games and I'm like, all right, who's doing what? Um, do I feel like I should make this lower? Do I feel like this is a good value? Uh, but you know, that's for game passes. I feel like I know my, my games really well. And we have tester community teams. We have data teams who are kind of giving us feedback um, on stuff that we want to price. So I feel like we're pretty on the spot with that usually. All right. So copy everybody else's price. No, um, I, I love all three of you talked about something and I just want to put the exclamation point on it. Cause you know, I always rant on this on any, if you've seen my economy talks, but time is probably sort of the bedrock that you want to sort of base your prices on. And I think that mentality that Ari talked about and that Sean talked about is exactly right. How much time am I essentially selling for this amount? Is that a fair value should be higher because I don't want them to just pay for it straight up and I want them to grind for it, it should be lower because I'm nice, right? That's typically where I also sort of start with my pricing. And I think that's generally a good direction to go. So we talked about it a little bit, the elephant in the room here, the maligned term that we never want our games to be called pay to win. Can we talk about that a little bit? What in your view is like a pay to win game and why is it a bad thing? Uh, so for for me, Percy, I'm sure Trip probably feels the same way. Pay to win is giving an unfair advantage to players willing to pay. And essentially, like uh, say, say for our game, for example, and um, basically cops in the game, they have, you know, a pair of handcuffs to arrest someone. And of course, there's a certain range on that. Now, say if we made it, so if you bought this game pass for 500 Robux, your handcuffs now has like a one mile range for whatever reason, you can <laughs> just pick people out of thin air. Now that's giving you a ridiculously unfair advantage and it's going to ruin the experience for free players because they're no longer going to be attracted since these people are just abusing the perk you gave them. Uh, yeah, and for pay to win, it's like I mentioned, it drives out the free players of your game and it just ruins the fun and your stats will reflect upon that with due time. Well, why would you want free players for your game? Aren't they just like moochers at that point? Like what is, what is the point of having free players in your game? Just to it, play that guy. <laughs> it's, it's not that we want free player. Well, we do want, we don't want people to feel like they have to pay money or be required to pay money, but you're always going to have free players. So just acknowledge you're going to have free players and you're going to have paid players and you want to make it fair for all players yeah even though i'm not like sort of a bio major here the analogy <laughs> i always use is kind of like algae in the ocean right if algae didn't exist everything else would be dead because that's like a main food source and that's not to say that your paid players are going to eat your free players but if your free players aren't there, those free players are friends of the paid players, their competition for the paid players, right? Their content for the paid players as well, right? So to your point, when your free players quit, then your game is kind of in this state of rot and decay where the free players drop off and your low end payers drop off and your mid payers drop off. And then eventually you have a dead game with zero concurrence, right? So yeah. it's a it's a very, very important part of your community that you definitely want to respect and, you know, give some love to. So. And like, uh, Arithia mentioned, um, your first mindset, it shouldn't necessarily be to get, you know, money, like, even though that's of course a great thing, but your first mindset should be, Hey, I want to make a great game. And the money is just a reward for the hard work you're putting in and all the experience you gathered along the way. Um, with the mindset, with you keeping that mindset of, yeah, I want to make a great game. Now, you should always basically keep in mind, yeah, I want to make a great game for free players. I want to make a great game for paid players. So you want to include everyone. And if one group is suffering because of the other, then what's the point, honestly? Yeah. What are what are the risks as well to over monetizing? Like what what kind of damage? Have you guys ever accidentally gone too deep on monetization and seen adverse effects? uh 
us, I don't think anything right off the top of my head. Um, but the, the adverse, well, I will say that when we were paid access and we were in this uh, Roblox event and we were paid access, um, there was some backlash. Um, and and we, we did lower our price, but we weren't ready to make the decision to go free to play yet. Um, and so the risk is to just have people steer away from your game um, or or if you if you lean too hard and put too many monetization tactics in there, it makes it easier to become pay to win and even without even knowing it. Um, and free players will just pull left out and stop playing. And like yeah. uh, we actually kind of hold ourselves back. Like it, it may sound weird, but I like look at the number of game passes we have. And I always just try to keep it at a reasonable number because I see sometimes other games, they may have like 20, 30 game passes. Maybe they have to open a new place to hold more game passes because they somehow reached a limit. And I'm just like, do we do we necessarily want to be that kind of game where you click on our page and you just see a full page of, hey, buy this, buy this, buy that? Or do we want to be that game where you hop in and actually have fun? So it's, yeah, it's just finding a balance with seeing it too. Yeah. Well, you guys are survivors of <laughs> that backlash, I guess. So this next question might be appropriate for you. Can a developer come back from over monetizing or un even unethically monetizing with their game? Um, and if so, like what can they do to rebuild trust with the community? Yes, um, you can come back. Like I said, um, um, we went into that event, uh, Roblox added us in. To my surprise, I didn't think we were going to make it because we were paid access. We were 50 Robux at the time. We lowered it um, down to 25 during the event as low as we could go um, without going free because, like I said, we weren't ready for that just yet. We uh, still had matchmaking servers still in the works and stuff. But um, the answer is you can fix the balance, um, say, if, if you have too many paid things or if... Um, if it's too expensive, you can lower the price, fix the balance, maybe remove some stuff. And then after that, to rebuild trust, add plenty of free content, add stuff that players really want and the players will enjoy and don't make them pay for it. And uh, with that, um, say in our case, when we did go free, we made sure all the people who pay, we all gave them like, we gave them all perks pretty much. So they got a free card, they got some in-game cash, they got I think a weapon in the game and you know they just got like perks such as that and it's like really important to be transparent about that just be like hey you know don't worry we didn't forget about you here is here's here you go pretty much and uh if you ever like do make a mistake whether it's either over monetizing or say one of your monetization methods fail for some reason like say a developer product all of a sudden not working between a set time period make sure you rectify it for those users so I know we've had maybe a few, maybe like two or three incidents in the past where like something happened and a developer product wasn't properly issued. So we went back in all the data and just had it specify, hey, if you bought something within this range, pop up a notification to you saying, hey, we messed up our bad. Here's how we're going to fix it. And here you go, pretty much. So, yeah. So communication once again. Yeah. Yeah, Harry, any any final words on that or ethics before we move on to uh, strategies? Um, okay, so going really far back really quick, I would say pay to win isn't always a bad strategy. Freaking Petsim X has, oh, the best like monetization. Like you just want to buy and like get more awesome pets. But I have to say they have a really great progression. Like it's not too fast because what they do is, you know, you don't get a pet that's super OP. Maybe it's 50% of all of your pets combined. That type of simulation pay, pay to win, I think is good. But that word is thrown so much in Creatures of Sonaria because it's a PvP, highly competitive game. And it's, it's unfortunate, it's inevitable, it's going to happen because we can never balance the game to be 100% fair for every single creature available to play as. But early on, what I did do is I was like, we're not going to have rarity in this game. All creatures are going to have 100% drop rate, which means all creatures are, you know, equal percent drops. And we have, you know, our testing team to scale all of those creatures very fairly, and we do it our best. But 
Um, so the word is always thrown around. I think it's unavoidable. People are always going to use it. Um, and it sucks, but you just have to do your best to do what you can to make the game fair for everybody. Yeah, That's it's, it's kind of that. part of like the game vernacular now, along with OP or broken, right? Yeah, the, the meta, you yeah. know, when that happens, obviously we go back, we take a look at creatures that people are having issues with. And there's a lot of rescaling, nerfing, you know, that that type of stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's move on. Let's talk about some monetization mechanics. Um, and, um, you know, I guess this one is probably most relevant for emergency response. But for you guys, we talked about it a little bit before. What are some considerations for developers weighing the choice between paid access and free to play? Yeah. So with us, um, first thing that went into that was the state of the game being early access. Um, we weren't ready to push it out to the market. We didn't want people to have a first impression of our bare bones version of the game, but we still wanted to get it out there and get you know some people to to give us some feedback and let some you know hardcore Roblox role play community fans get their hands on the game and check it out and so that's why we went paid access and um, to add on to that i think if you are um, determining whether or not to make your game paid access think does it provide a value and is it unique does it have enough uniqueness and value that players want to pay for it and i think with our game um, we really did because within the like emergency services police role play city role play genre of games um, ours was very much different than those in the past that it was it offered a lot more role play and immersion and uh, features like uh, that that put you like a real life cop in the game but it was also very much anybody could play it and play the game without you know doing a training in a group or anything and that's what made ours unique and valuable to the players mm -hmm. and what's like the the difference are there some like main differences that you notice between like when your game is paid access and free to play like the kind of player that you have or um uh, um well uh sean you want to talk about like the private servers and, and matchmaking yeah sure so uh when we were paid access um since you kind of paid for the game pretty much you wanted to get the most out of it and you likely were a role player yourself so the role play experience in terms of you know people going along and stuff in public servers it was like a frequent site, but when we went free, obviously that kind of decreased since more free players came in and a lot of people just want to hurry up and grind and finish the game. So we released uh, private servers and, you know, matchmaking servers where matchmaking means uh, if you have a certain amount of XP and a certain amount of playtime in the game, you get to be in a private server with, you know, people of similar stats. And in those servers, we usually see a little bit more role play and in private servers where communities could make their own server just for their own community so only their members could join and play that's where we see like the peak amount of role play so you could have a private community you know moderating and doing their own thing setting up cool scenarios and that's where the i guess the role play experience really is at its peak yeah now did you guys go free to play with that system in or was it something that you added later yeah, we went with the, that was, uh, like Trip mentioned earlier, that was the contingency for us to go free to play. We mm -hmm. had to make sure the private service system was great and matchmaking was where it needed to be. Yeah. And do you feel like that was sort of the key to your success of transitioning to free to play? Uh, it, it definitely, it definitely was because when we, when we were looking at other games that went free to play, um, we saw certain mistakes that were, were made and we just noticed a lot of people complaining, Hey, you know, these people are coming ruin our experience so we figured all right let's make a kind of safe space in a sense for the players who have all these high stats already and let's put them in their own server if they so choose so they could still have a similar experience to what they had before i believe we have an image of that too right of the servers aaron yeah and just to add on to that um uh matchmaking servers and private servers are a very big part of it but i think in addition just having a a game that um that protects players from themselves and that is a good game overall uh that's very important for uh maintaining our success going free to play and uh yeah this is our matchmaking servers here where you have to have a certain amount of xp to go play with other players of similar experience levels so that way you don't have some hardcore role player with you know dozens of hours logged into the game 
playing against somebody who just joined the game today or yesterday. And we even have a, a set of servers for voice enabled users, um, for those who want to role play with other voice users. Um, that adds a whole new level of role play immersion. Yeah, this is all great to see because it's it is really important that you get players with similar interests and values playing together because otherwise you have a weird mish mishmash of people who are grinding versus role playing and they're not really getting that meaningful experience that they want and i know that's that's something a lot of people who are currently paid access struggle with in their fear of going free to play is that a lot of players that are ingrained in their paid access system are going to lose that core experience that they've come to love about your game right so yeah um, I don't at know, least in my mind, I, I also agree with you. I feel like this was an essential system that you had to go out with when you made that transition. So, Yeah. I remember we kept bothering you all the time like because you kept <laughs> pushing for us to go free, and we're just like, yeah, I don't know about that, but <laughs> glad it all worked out. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, moving on. Uh, are there any advantages in having in-game currencies as opposed to just Robux? Arithia, I want to toss this one to you first. Sorry. Yes, definitely. I would say all the free to play players, you want to give them an experience too, because in the end, like your game is made for everybody. So having that free in game currency can give those free to play players a chance to access all content in your game. And that's definitely something that I try to do have a variety of ways for players to obtain even blocked off content that normally would be Robux. So, you know, in Creatures of Sonaria, we do have Robux creatures, but you can trial those creatures with the in-game currency. That way you can kind of test them out. If you're, you know, just thinking of purchasing it, you can see if you like it kind of like a test run. So it's like, it's like getting those free samples from like the makeup store and stuff. Yeah. And obviously they, they have their own limits. So it's not that OP either. They're scaled properly. You know, you're a male when you spawn in, so you can't lay eggs and have other people join as your creature. And uh, they also have cool bonuses where you get like a 25% chance increase to glow. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And what are the benefits of of making that stuff available? I know I joked about the free samples, but like, what is the benefit of free samples or even just access to the same content that somebody who could spend Robux? Um, you know, I would say just it existing at all kind of lets the players be like, oh wow, like even though I might not have a lot of Robux, like I spent so much time in this game, like it's my favorite game ever, and I get to trial this creature, like. I, I guess it puts you in a, a brighter light by the community. Uh, but also like if someone is just on the verge of like buying something, just having that for them to try. And, you know, if that in-game purchase with your in-game currency is what changes their mind, like, oh yeah, I want to buy that. Like that, that's great. Um, and emergency response for you guys as well, right? Um, same question for you. Advantages to in-game currencies. Like what does it do for your game? Yeah. Um, well, my obvious answer here is you can reward in-game currencies to players and you can't give them Robux. For example, uh, you want to give uh, cops a paycheck for arresting criminals or criminals, you want to give them a reward for robbing the bank. You give them, you can reward them currencies, which you can't do for Robux. And you, the, the players can, can work for it, can collect and use that to buy something instead of having to buy Robux. And then that goes into having multiple currencies for say different lines of pro progression of uh, different teams you could have different currencies to um so we we you rely more on xp on the teams and then cash on the civilian team so that that way you could you could work and progress as a criminal on the civilian team or you can go and work and progress as a cop on the police team or the fire department team and you can um do those in whatever combination you want you can play on the police team 24 7 you could do a little bit of both um whatever is most important for you and even uh, like limited time events you can do currencies for events and um, so the players have to participate in the event to to purchase things from the event store things like that yeah so why would you want to do I guess in terms of monetization, why would you want to do an event currency for events? Like what's the benefit of that versus just using your regular currency? Well, if it was just the regular currency, then players who 
have been playing the game and already have the currency, well, they don't need to participate in the event. They could just use their hoarded cash and just go buy everything out on day one. And then you don't have, they, they're, they're not playing the event and you don't have the participation that you're looking for. Um, so in our Halloween event, for example, you can go trick-or-treating and you get candy. And that candy is our event currency. And then they can go to the Halloween shop and buy some, some special potions or things like that. Um, for the the Halloween limited time event, limited time. We'll we'll get to limited time events in a bit as a monetization strategy. Uh, but Ari, same question for you. Event currencies. Do you guys use those in your game as well? Oh yeah, we have you know three Halloween events going on right now throughout our games. And we always have used a limited currency. And part of it is like, oh yeah, we don't want players who, you know, with our sometimes broken economies, we don't want them to be able to purchase out, skip all the Halloween content that we've been working on um, just to be able to get everything immediately. So spending time with the Halloween events is really important, but also usually Halloween events throughout our games have really, really sought after content by the players. And it's also a time for us to introduce some new content. So for the previous content that they see as extremely rare items, we want those to kind of represent their rarity through their, their price. So we're going to set those higher value based on how the community already views them. And, you yeah. know, newer items are a little bit cheaper because they need time to saturate and develop their value naturally. So I would say always events, just introduce a new currency. Otherwise, you know, put rich players who played your game are just going to buy it out and be able to skip all that amazing content that you've created for them. Yeah, I, I've experienced the same thing where no matter how tight your economy, there's always going to be the hoarders who, who just have like boatloads of cash. So like event currencies are a great way to just start everybody at zero for that specific event, especially like in your example of Halloween, if you're starting on October 1st and you're designing it such that getting the best item in the event takes them, let's say 20 days of engagement, right? Like yeah. you can't do that with your own currency because some players are going to be halfway there already at the beginning or all the way there at the beginning, right? So it's just a great way to start from zero. Yeah, exactly. You can kind of see it there and we do like show, oh, this is the best value to kind of be like, if you want the best bang for your buck, this is what option you want to buy. Yeah. Have you, have you had a UI before where you didn't have that tag in there in terms of displaying the best value? No, I think we use that throughout all of, all of our okay. games, even if it's in di slightly different format, we always have, you know, you get 10% more just for free if you buy this tier. Yeah, because I was I was going to ask if you had seen the benefit of adding it on there. Um, spoiler. Yeah, see this one. <laughs> There's but a we, huge benefit to doing that. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, right now we can't see the exact purchases that users are making, which kind of is a little bit frustrating. But I, I know like at RDC, they said they're working on better analytics for us. So hopefully mm -hmm. soon. But, you know, players like to get free free bonuses so those numbers are always cool to see yeah and it's not enough just to give them that free bonus it's important to do the math for them right because mm -hmm. what percentage i mean even i'll ask the audience here what percentage of you have gone to a store and done the sat down with a pen and paper and done the math of which one is the best deal right i'm so gonna lie i kind of am that first <laughs> <laughs> like if everyone I other than sean brands, <laughs> i'm taking out a calculator and figuring it out <laughs> Right. But that's time that you could have spent actually playing the game versus just making the purchase and going. Right. Mm -hmm. So there, there's huge benefit to just not only giving these offerings because you're incentivizing players to make a bigger purchase, but also helping them make that decision by doing the math for them. And on that topic, uh, we we also have a picture of our in-game currency shop and we, we do that with the best value, but we also put how much exec um, how much money in game they get for every one Robux. And, and you can see how much it increases with each, with each level of, of um, products. And uh, I think that really, that's really good for, for people seeing the value of bigger, bigger bundles. Yep, so, yeah. Yeah. You can see there, it starts at like, uh, let's see, what does that say? $214 per one Robux. And then the highest one, is five hundred and seventy-one dollars for one Robux. So 
um, that's very tempting. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you you did the exact math here. Was this Sean in his calculator again? I think it's actually uh, <laughs> just done that code. Oh, awesome. There you go. The calculator right. method never fails. <laughs> All right, moving on. And this is a popular one I've seen. Um, limited time items and rotating shops. Um, do any of you guys include these in your games? So we we have done it. Um, and we've made mistakes in the past. Uh, basically, for a limited time items, you should be able to keep them unless there's something like consumables, like, you know, stuff you a player can purchase multiple times, maybe, and use often. But say if it's like a one-time purchase during a Halloween event, uh, you kind of want to make sure they can keep it. Because one year we offered, I believe, and if you finish the event, you got to have a cool Halloween custom livery. And then when Halloween was over, we took that back and, you know, we got some backlash for that. So it's kind of good to make sure that if you're going to include something like as grand as that, where it's not a consumable, make sure that once the event ends, they still keep it or else backlash is kind of inevitable. Mm -hmm. It's a very good point. Um, have any of you experimented with rotating shops before? I, I would say, yeah, we, okay, not only rotation shops, but limited time items. We do that a lot. Um, like in DA, we have the um, the monthly dragons that players work towards all month to obtain. Or in Creatures of Sonaria, we have, you know, the, I mean, in Dragon Adventures too, we have Halloween, Christmas themed creatures. And I guess those, those are, those have always been permanent. Like we've never had temporary stuff besides boost, but like when you have that type of limited time stuff, players are going to see it as much more rare. So they're going to get, they can get very fiery over it, especially when it returns the next year. Um, here is something I kind of experimented with. This is a rotational shop that actually gives the creature kind of a subtle rarity. Um, so every, you know, 12 or six hours, I think this will rotate. And every time the player buys a creature, the price will go up. Um, and we do make sure that this shop specifically cycles all types of rarities. Um, so if it's been cycling common for a while, it tr it'll try to get in a rare creature. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think this has been seen as a negative thing. Honestly, this was used to kind of patch up a mistake that happened. Um, the economy kind of got way too much money. Um, so this was our effort to kind of sink that back out. And I, I believe it did work for the most part. Yeah. Do you find players often sort of engaging with that still? Um... Again, it's definitely hard to tell <laughs> because we can't see those exact purchases. I, I, I think we need more analytics on that. But, you know, just by seeing those creatures in game, people are people interact with it based on if the creature's cool, if it has cool abilities. But always players are collectors. They want at least one of each creature in the entire game. So they'll interact or receive those creatures, whether it's by the shop directly or trading. Yeah. Um, in that sort of same light, do you have have you guys had any experience running sales in your game do you guys do any sales for like holidays or summer events or anything like that i don't think we do sales so if you if you guys want to talk on that we've done sales in the past um although not too often and that's a good thing um so sales for us is a good way to bring attention to your store um players even though players know you have a store, they've seen it before, but then all of a sudden you advertise a weekend sale and they go and check it out and they look at all the prices again and they reconsider everything again. Um, and then the fact that we don't have it too often, maybe just a handful of times a year, that means that players, um, well, if you do do it too often, players will look kind of look forward to the sales and anticipate the sales and just own, learn to only buy things during the sales. Um, as opposed to just buying things at regular price. So sales uh, are good. They they will refresh and bring attention to your store if maybe your sales are slowing, but not too often or or it's not going to sell at full price. Yeah, that's a that's a very very good point and a cautionary tale that I've experienced on the very first game I worked on. They ran a sale every month, 
And the only thing it accomplished it, at first, it monetized pretty well. But then the only thing it accomplished was it trained anybody who was going to spend to only spend during the sales, right? So you have to be very, very, very careful of if you're going to run sales, when you're going to run them, and not at a predictable frequency that your players then are essentially paying you less than they would have for the things that you're offering, right? Definitely. I would I would also add that you want to make sure that your monetization graphs are in a good place before you do a sale because you are going to see your graphs dip a little bit. You know, players are buying stuff cheaper. So you, you just want to be careful, make sure you're in a place where you are able to do sales. And I, I definitely am really interested in now maybe using sales to bring attention to places that aren't seen as often. I really like that. Um, and every game would probably have a little different results, but whenever we do sales, um, uh, maybe like a 25, 30% sale uh, off, we see a huge spike, not necessarily dip, but a huge like two, three, four times increase um, in revenue uh, over whatever it is we're putting sale on. So uh, might vary from game to game, but that's our experience. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for part one of the Level Up Roundtable on monetizing a Roblox experience. Part two, featuring Q&A with Arithia, Shawnee G, and Mr. Fergie is coming soon. So keep an eye out on the Roblox Level Up YouTube channel. See you there.